and if it matches, then we continue each other down. If uh, the value there uh, was wrong, then, for example, we may return some error. So, here this jump, conditional jump, uh, will jump to fail. This is not uh, more important. We are interested how to shut down hypervisor, but um, if we should implement also this code uh, for properly error handling. So now the uh, hypervisor shutdown itself. Uh, it is not too complicated. It is necessary to restore about 30 registers or more. I didn't count it exactly. The shutdown is only one procedure if, if they are simple enough. And uh, it is necessary to make some prologue, some epilogue, and something between, between these. Uh, the pro, uh, I, I must uh, explain you some structures and some data uh, what we need uh, to do the shutdown. Uh, we will have uh, some, some space on, on the stack uh, filled with, uh, with, with these uh, values and we will have some data uh, which, which are only VMCS fields in codings and there are about 30, 30 fields uh, everywhere. Uh, this one in codings belongs to this one field and they follow in this exact order. Uh, it is not, not, not complicated and the number of the, uh, double boards here must match the, the count of cohorts here. And the count of the fields is, is calculated very simple by dividing the size of this with the value to well, in the prologue itself, we need to push, we need to push these five uh, registers because we destroy them and we also need uh, the uh, stack space uh, of five words to the final instruction. So the stack frame uh, consists of these, these uh, all fields and the count of them is multiplied with A because they are rewards and the size is C then we need another 16 bytes for stack frame from, for internal descript of table and 16 bytes for global descript uh, of table in fact we need only 10 bytes but we use 16 so because it will be aligned so we, we subtract this whole stack frame from stack pointer. This is probably pushing registers and prepare the stack frame. And then in six instructions we read every every DMCS field what we need for shutdown. Uh, it is uh, it seems to be too complicated, but um, it is really possible to read all. VMCS fields using only six instructions in this simple way. The ECX holds the count of them minus one because we used this jump sign uh, instruction. Uh, the LDX register points into this field and the stack pointer plus plus some displacement points, points here, into this structure. So, we read all the MCS fields in six instructions. This instruction loads the MCS field encoding, and these instructions read the VMCS field itself into the stack, stack frame. And then, uh, after we read everything, we are allowed to execute the VMX of instruction. After executing this instruction, we only 
it won't be possible anymore to read any, any field from the Linux CS. So, uh, we, uh, we turn off the virtualization by the DMC of its instruction. And then we need to restore some registers of ring 0 or guest. Now it is not guest because virtualization is off. So, uh, the most uh, difficult thing is to load uh, the control register free. Because it is the point of the paging tables no? for the translation tables. There are two approaches how to do that. I saw uh, you, uh, you do it using uh, identity map memory page. Uh, it is, by my opinion, not not so nice way, but it is possible. But it uh, leads into some trouble. And the second uh, approach is to do it uh, in the same way as operating systems which is task tasks because every task has each own, each own uh, private virtual memory uh, translation tables and we will do it in this second way it is much more nice and less complicated for that we use the feature called global, global pages Global pages are special pages uh, which stay in the memory translation even we load another control register feed. They, they stay in uh, translation of side buffer. Uh, so for do that at first we enable this bit in control register 4. It is page global enable bits. Um, three instructions are enough to enable that. Uh, then we need uh, to change uh, every entry in translation table uh, and set its uh, global bit to be enabled. And also uh, there is enough to execute seven instructions to do that. It is not not complicated, I will show you a picture of what really happens. The RDX register points to page tables. The hypervisor, of course, may have the paging tables fragmented or not in a continual block, but I show you the simplest possible way. The paging tables are only fits into 4 kilobytes and it is only one page of memory and for example the hypervisor which now don't exist anymore it was running under this virtual memory so we point at the X to paging to all paging tables of hypervisor we are still somewhere in the middle of the day the paging tables of hypervisor still exist even the hypervisor is now off in the ECX, we put the count of entries there, and now we, we set on the page, the PTE global bit in every entry there. It seems to be complicated, but I'll show you a picture of what happens. Well, uh, I don't know whether it is well visible, but we will, we will change these bits. Now they are zero and we change it to be one. It is bit eight of every entry in page table. This is the code itself. The RDX points to the page table here. We start here. The ECX holds the count minus one because the last instruction is channel line. And this is the loop itself. We load not the whole but only the part of the PTE. We set the bit 8 to 1 and we write it back into memory. I use this instruction to write it directly into, into the physical memory and bypass caches. 
And what happens then? All these beads, which were which were zero, are now one. That is partial bead complete. What happens? Zero change to one. Zero change to one. Everything. Here also. This is what happens. So we enabled the one bit in control register four, and we enabled one every entry in page tables to be global. This is the first step necessary. Then we we continue and we we modified paging tables. It is uh, very good to. Uh, execute this instruction there after modifying paging tables. We invalidated the transactional Lucas I buffer by copying the CRT to itself. In fact, the control register free doesn't change it, but it is necessary to flush the buffer. And now uh, we are going to restore control registers. This is the value of the guest control register for it in the stack frame reload it into general purpose register control register 3 and control register 0 we uh, typically these bits are set to 1 but not to risk and to be sure we must them to be set on paging global enabled and physical address extension they, they must be enabled because we are restoring, we are going to restore the 64 bit operating uh, system. Also, paging must be enabled and this, these bits must be, must be one protective mode also. So, uh, after uh, loading them from the stack frame, we may uh, write them into control registers. This is the this is the most difficult to restore, but we prepared global pages. Uh, now this instruction passes normally and doesn't cause on any exception. After after restoring control of the register of the 4, 3 and 0, we are enabled to restore the script of tables. Uh, we restore global pages global descriptor tables and interrupt descriptor table. Uh, we load limit and basis. We put them together into the stack frame. And we load them from the stack frame. After loading global, global descriptor table, we are allowed to restore selectors. We now restore these five selectors, ES, DS, FS, GS, and local descriptor more register also. Uh, the CS and SS will be restored at the end at the problem. Now we don't restore them, we will postpone them and need. Now the task register, it is uh, one, uh, one complicated thing uh, there because the <coughs> task register, after loading task register, the task is always marked busy. We must uh, set one bit of the task register uh, to, uh, to zero to be uh, not busy, but uh, uh, well, yeah, it's, well, we load, we load uh, the TS selector into the EX register, we backup it into the ECX register. We mask off these three bits. These three bits are privilege level. This one bit is stable indicator, uh, which uh, shows this between global and local descriptor table. If uh, bit 2 of PR selector is 0, then we continue normally. If it is set to 1, the task register is uh, in uh, local descriptor table. Uh, FDX now holds the base of global table. Uh, uh, this 
NDX register holds the value of global descript of table base. So uh, we mask this one bit to zero and the, we must prepare the, the task available task. The task must be available. We can load only available task. After uh, setting the, this one bit to uh, zero, the task is available and we are allowed to load the, the task with this instruction. After this instruction executes, the task again becomes busy. This is common cycle. It happens every, every, every time when you load task. If you forget to mask this, this, mask this bit to zero, then this instruction causes global, uh, general protection exception. So we restore the task register and then we continue. We restore FS base and GS base registers which are under 64 bits. Uh, uh, in the uh, model specific control registers, we write them using the write model specific register instruction. Uh, one thing I must say to you executing this instruction, moving anything into FS or GS, will always damage their bases. We cannot exchange the order of restoring that. If we loaded the basis before these instructions, then executing these instructions uh, destroys the basis. So the basis must be loaded after loading these selectors. So we restore FS base and GS basis. Then restoring the C-Center model specific registers. Only nine instructions. And we, uh, then we restore the bug registers at first, we test VM exit controls bit 2. If this bit is set to 1, then we can restore them. If this bit is set to 0, then we cannot restore them because they weren't safe during VM exit and they were not over, overwritten with the values of the host. We are going to restore the, the guest registers. So, if this bit is sent to set one, we are allowed to restore debug controls and the debug register seven. Other debug registers aren't set either change during the MX. So uh, we are going to finish uh, the last five registers which we need to restore are uh, uh, instruction pointer, CS, flex, stack pointer and stack, stack selector. Uh, it is quite simple, only the instruction pointer must be calculated because uh, the instruction pointer now, uh, now points to the beginning of this instruction. And we must add the instruction size to point the instruction pointer to the following instruction. This instruction has size 3 bytes and the CPU is 2. So we load the current instruction pointer, we add the instruction size, then we load the CS selector, flex stack pointer of the guest and the stack selector and we signalize VM success by creating these all bits in place. Now we are almost at the end. We discard the stack pointer, we restore the NDP register and we write the new instruction pointer there when the guest will resume its execution, we store, we store MDX register and store control and code selector there, we store MDX register and store the flex register, we store the RCX register and store the stack <coughs> register, we store 
RDX register and store stack selector there. And the final instruction is the return from internet. This instruction has a prefix of 48 every time because it signalized that the, this instruction is for 64 bit. Without the prefix, uh, if it is only run by uh, uh, hexadecimal, it is CF. Uh, it is not enough. It must be every time received, received with the C, uh, 48 hexadecimal and the hexadecimal CF. This instruction has two bytes. And this instruction restores instruction pointer, call selector, flex, stack pointer, and stack selector. And runs the OS. And now we uh, return from the hypervisor VM exit handle. This is, in fact, returning from the hypervisor handle, handle break. This was the instruction which breaks in the hypervisor, and the return from interrupt was instruction which launches us here. We set the uh, flex to signalize success, so no carry flag, either zero flag are set, they are cleared, so no failure but success, and we perform some cleanup. The cleanup is quite small, we only kick off from the translation Lucasite buffer some pages which we used to switch the control register free during changing of virtual memory translation tables. It is uh, done by the invalidate PG. Only six instructions. It is not complicated. After performing cleanup, there are almost no traces that the hypervisor was running. So, that was a very hard to turn of hypervisor and resume operating system with about 100 instructions. Was it good? I don't think. Uh, it was very poor. It is too much. 100 instructions. It is terrible. And now I present you one small guy who is able to turn off the hypervisor in one instruction. Not 100, but only in one instruction. <laughs> so, and now the guy, this one guy, is thinking how to resume the operating system in one instruction. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, you said um, in, when running in guest in ring 3, uh, you said the VM call cannot be used. I think you suppose it generates gener general protection fault to guest ring 0. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, it was in the beginning. Yeah. So, uh, are you sure about that? Have you tried it? Because I. I think I'm not sure, but I think our loader, which folder wrote, uh, uses VM call in user mode in guest to call to the hypervisor. And it works, I think. I don't know, I, I always execute this VM call from ring 0. Uh, I think that uh, it is not, uh, uh, it, it causes general protection under uh, No? Right, I think it doesn't. I didn't try it. Even if it does, you can catch that exception, surely. But even if it does call it the is protected instruction, I, I think that it is allowed only in the ring zero. Right. I didn't try yeah, it under ring three. Yeah. This instruction right. It is possible to to settle and execute the CPU with under ring yeah. three. No, under ring three, but no, try it. I am not sure. Because I, I didn't try it, yeah. but I think that it will cause.